So uh, welcome to Conversations at the New York School of the Arts. My name is Patricio Molina, and I'm the uh, director of the conservatory at the school. With me, we have also the executive director of the school, Larry Tamburi. And we have a very special guest, a composer, musician, tr a jazz trumpetist, community activist, author, and poet, uh, Hannibal Lacumbe. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Mr. Lacumbe has, uh, uh, you know, has been celebrating and commemorating the African American experience through music and words for over four decades, and he has been commissioned by some of the uh, major uh, orchestras around the country. So it's a true pleasure to have you here with us, uh, Mr. Lacumbe. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So you 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 do some poetry. You do uh, you know uh, jazz uh, uh, music. Uh, you also compose. Where does all of this inspiration come from? You know, do do musicians have to cultivate a sort of a spirituality? Well, I I think the initial seed. Uh, uh, dropped into my life, the, the pond of my life was, uh, it took place in the cotton fields. Uh, and there I began to really see the power that music could have on the physical and the mental um, uh, state of a human being. <clears throat> As Mozart said, in his Republic, he would control the music because of its ability to influence the people. Uh, John Coltrane said, <clears throat> music had the ability to alter the consciousness. So as a little boy in the cotton field, I saw, <clears throat> I saw the physical and spiritual restoration of my people when it got so hot, it became so hot that no human could exist there. And so when I would take them water, they would throw it in the air. When it got, when the heat became so intense, they were covered in shrouds of heat. They began to sing. And that's when I made the connection that music has the ability to make hot cold to make coal hot. It has the ability to, to rejuvenate the spirit and the body. So that's where it began. And so from that moment on, I always made sure that I paid tribute and honor to the, to the profundity of, of, that, of that observation that I made. So all of my music, is to bring about a healing and restoration of human beings. So you have you and your family have a big history in in Bellstrup County. What what does that mean for you, and how does it impact your music? It means everything. Before I began a, a, a composition, the one you commissioned to God Mississippi and a man called Evans, I always go to the to the cemetery and I just sit sometimes for hours, sometimes overnight. And I ask that the the spirit of my great grandfather who came, who was brought to America in a slave ship, my grandmother, my grandfather, I always ask them for guidance. What, what, what should I say about this piece? What should I do? My great grandfather said in the case of Medgar Evers piece that I was to go and do a, a ceremony uh, in, the, in the carport where he, was, where he bled to death, moving uh, towards his family, trying to protect his family <clears throat> and actually in the newspaper article, uh, I found out they took a photograph of that ceremony. Mm. I did the ceremony of, of remembrance. 
And I go from there because the most important thing for me is to get out of the way of my own understanding, which is so limited. Uh, that's key to, to put your ego in check so that you can hear the universal information that needs to be given to the people. So as a result, in all of my work, there is no call for vengeance. There's no cry of vengeance. There's no profanity, just a story. It, 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 that sounds wonderful. Um, the, the part that I have a hard time understanding is the topics with which you're dealing are so profound and deep and, and tragic at times. How do, you, how do you deal with that? Again, as I say, if it were me, it would only address uh, my response to that violence perpetrated against people of color. It, it would only address people of color. Mm -hmm. But when I ask the ancestors, when I ask the spirits to teach me, to show me what it is, it addresses everyone. And that is the truth. Uh, that is the truth of of a statement, mm -hmm. or of a piece of music, when it addresses everyone, the universality of it all. For me, then I know I'm onto something. I wrote a piece for the Philly Orchestra entitled "One Land, One River, One People." In my understanding, I thought for sure it was one land was Africa one river, the Nile, one, one people, the people of color. Mm -hmm. But when I went to the forest and I, and I meditated, this, the ancestors showed me that the one land is the flesh of humanity. The one river is the blood of humanity. One people is the spirit of humanity took the piece in an ent entirely different tonal direction. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting how uh, composers and artists try to find the world that is the unknown world. You know, <laughs> you, you know what we know, but yeah. if you go up like beyond that and try to <laughs> yeah. that, um, bring it to the known world somehow like, the way we understand it yeah. and, uh, it's, it's amazing that you 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 go to that the unknown world through meditation and uh, you know and just silence you know so um what is what what was the uh the genesis for the 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 work uh African portraits? Well, growing up in the South here, once I left my grandmother's farm, I was always set upon. I was always, always set upon by society. And so my fifth birthday, I, I, I still was, I, I wasn't wearing shoes when I was five years old because on the farm, it was so beautiful. I, want, I felt the magnetism of the earth in my feet, the sand, the mud. They, they had to corral, corral me to, to uh, put shoes on me because it was such a horrible transition. And I would always throw them away. But at any rate, my, my fifth birthday, uh, I had to keep on these shoes in order to go into town to go to this uh, soda shop. So we went to the soda shop and uh, we went to the soda shop and I, I ran inside. My mother saw one of her friends, they were talking outside. And I, uh, I ran and jumped up on the bar stool to get my soda. And the woman, the woman, uh, The woman cursed me like I was a, a sick animal. 
because at that time, people of color were not allowed to sit on the bar stool. So I'm five years old, right? And what she put into me, the venom she put into me lasted until I was 30 years old. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, my, great, my great birthday present when I was 30 years old was to no longer feel what she had put into me. And to this day, she doesn't even realize that had I told my mother, I ran outside and told my mother I wanted to go to the river. My mother said, what's wrong, baby? What do you want, don't you want your soda? I said, no, mama. You know, I realized then that I saved that woman's life because my mother was fierce. And had I, had I told her what the woman had done to me, I know she would have gone in and injured her. But they're, they're these, they're these uh, gifts that we have when we make certain decisions. When Medgar Evers made a decision not to use his, his consummate skills as a killer that he learned in the army, uh, in the Normandy invasion, no less. When he resisted the beast telling him, look, why don't you put down that picket sign you have walking in front of the, the uh, library and the zoo to try and make it possible that your children can go see a lion or read a book. Why don't you put that down, get your M1, go down to the state capitol and start shooting these people, these white people who are oppressing you. So Medgar had this decision to make. And when he said no, then this, this spirit said to him, now, Tell me, what is your greatest wish in life? Medgar said, what I wish can't be possible. Well, tell me, I wish that my sons, my children, my daughter could see me when they are adults, <clears throat> that they could see me as I now am. And so the spirit said, it has already been done. So. 30 some years later, when Michael de Baden uh, was commissioned to exhume Medgar's body for the trial against Beckwith, the, the deranged man who killed him, his son Van came with him and went to the hotel because de Baden didn't want him to see the condition of Medgar's body when they exhumed it. But when they exhumed it, the bottom freaked out and called, called Van over and looked at his father's body that, that looked as though it had only been buried for three days. His suit, his clothing was dry. Wow. So therefore that grant was, was uh, that wish was granted. That Medgar, Medgar's son, got to see his body the way it looked the night he was killed. Wow. That's what happens when you get out of your own way and you ask for help. You, you, you said, show me, you say, show me, show me what I'm to do, show me what I'm to write. A, a, a very well-known rapper, around the time you came to New Orleans, Larry, uh, sent someone over to say to me, He'll pay me $60,000 if he could sample my, one of my trumpet solos. I said, well, no problem. Uh, let me see the lyrics that are going to be on the, on the record. He said, what do you want to see that for? I said, because whenever I write something, I take my text and I go to where my ancestors' bones lie and I read them. He said, well, uh, how about I give you 80,000 and you mind your business? I said, you couldn't give me 80 million. That's part of my process. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I, I, I said, well, we, we, you know, you can't do that, man. Because this, this stuff is, people died for this music. And I would die for this music. So uh, I don't know. I, 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 kinda, I guess I, I, I kind of forgot your question, but. 
<laughs> it was leading me in that direction. So forgive me. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I just <laughs> find that I find it very interesting and inspiring. <laughs> the way, the way you, uh, you let the process uh, guide you instead of you forcing it to sh to a to a certain way you know you just let it come to you and and even even the meaning changes according to these unknown forces yeah. and it's it's, yeah. it's 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 inspiring you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> so what what are you uh working on uh today uh i'm working on an opera entitled uh the Jonah people, a legacy of struggle and triumph. And all of my works are extremely visual and I consider them all to be opera in, na in nature. But this will be the first time I will actually have a, have all of the elements of an opera, lighting, staging, <laughs> um actors orchestras uh, i i'm so i'm so i'm so excited oh now i realize what you asked me before about african portraits so i had to discover why this stranger this perfect stranger in a soda shop would say and do that to me uh, I was confused for so many years because I lived in heaven on my grandmother's farm. And so as, as, as I left the farm and I began to, to be in the society at large, I, I, saw that, I saw that white people really, it was something about me that make that upset them that that unsettled them and all levels of of harm and all degrees of of terror i experienced and set up on it at the hands of white people and so i said I want to discover why that is. I want to discover why this skin is so unsettling to so many people. Why this hair is so unsettling to so many white people. And so in 1979, I was diagnosed with double pneumonia. I was living in New York City and I said, well, I'll go to the land of my ancestors and die. So I left, I got on an airplane with three vials of penicillin my doctor gave me and my trumpet. And I wrote my mother a letter to thank her and everything because I wasn't coming, I was gonna come back, you know. And so I met this man named Marasi who met me. No one knew I was going. I didn't even know, know what part of Africa I was going. BOAC Airlines to London, from London to Kenya. I said, well, I want the first plane leaving to Africa. So that's why I, how I wound up going to Kenya. So when I was there, I saw the truth, not the Tarzan truth, not the, not the Tarzan lies that I grew up seeing. This blonde haired, blue eyed man, chasing 18 powerful black Africans through the jungles, speaking languages to the lions and the elephants, and they're helping him chase these men. And when they, get, when they find them, what are they wearing? They're wearing lion's claw. All my friends would say, get him, Tarzan, get him, Tarzan. And I was saying, man, something's not right about this. Oh, be quiet. You always want to dis disrupt everything. Composers should be disruptors. <laughs> Great composers should be disruptors. Great artists should be disruptors. Yeah. Jesus was a disruptor. So, but at any rate, uh, when, he catch the, when he catches up with the guys, what are they wearing? They're wearing lion's cloth. 
So I said, well, man, how did they get to, how did they get the, the, the skins off of the lion? They didn't have muskets. Mm -hmm. So they had to you have a spear or a knife. And you can't really be that afraid of one man and, and, and not be afraid of a lion to get close enough to kill it with a spear and a knife. So I said, all this stuff is a lie. But at any rate, when I went there, when I went to die, I discovered the truth. The, the, the healer gave me some Achaia leaves, some tea from Achaia leaves that healed me. Then he showed me stacks of parchment papers from bot a botanist who had come from all over the world to study plants with him. And they wanted to thank him saying, this plant is now used in peels all over the world. So, so this adage that that I am nothing but a savage and that, and that I'm ignorant and that I don't have knowledge. It was all blown out of the water. Mm -hmm. So the biggest, the biggest dilemma I had was when I was first to leave the Maasai. I didn't want to leave. They had, had accepted me. I had a wife and didn't even know it culturally. So I had to leave because my mother was still here and I could not leave my mother. And we wept for hours. The warriors and I, the children, we wept for hours because it was clear that I had to leave. And before I left, Marasi, the translator, spoke with the king and the, and the king told him, tell my son, that whatever he does with the knowledge he has been given, do not yield to the force of destruction, the force of anger. And when I got back to my New York City apartment, I stayed in my apartment for three weeks. My neighbor gave me food because it was too painful to go outside now that I had known the truth about why white men would kill me because of the texture of my hair. And, and so instead of being angry, I wrote African portraits. And the first word of African portraits to, to comply with the command of that chief, the first word of Af African portrait is God, and the last word of African portraits is God. So saying all of that to say, African portraits was the result of my search of my physical being. One land, one river, one people was the re result of my search of my spiritual being. So those are the bookends of my life. One dealing with the flesh, the other with the spirit. Wow. Sorry, it was like I was like an old T model four that had to you had to keep really trying to crank up to get it going, you know. But once <laughs> you get it going, it's <laughs> wow. Wow. That's <laughs> so um you were uh, mentioning uh, a little bit about your your opera. You're working on, on, on a new opera. Yes, yes. One <laughs> land, one river, one people. Um, it's a commission by the Nashville Symphony. Um, Is Alan Valentine still still there? Yes. Yeah, Alan's an yes. old friend. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And in many ways, like we, when you were in New Jersey, from you, I felt this uh, tailwind. Sometimes working with orchestras, I felt a lot of headwind mm -hmm. because they didn't really understand my mode of work, of, of working and my mode of operation. Um, but I knew they would. When the downbeat comes, everything's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know that downbeat that's the defining moment right that's right yeah but but uh 
this piece is really to to restore the faith and the and the the lives of people who have been set upon for 400 years in this land and like with Medgar there's so much research that has gone into it but first of all the ancestors gave me this piece to to among many other things bring a kind of clarity to the people called African Americans to to bring a kind of unification of those and the descendants of those stolen from Africa, put aboard ships and chains and ships to, shipped to all parts of the world to be slaves for, uh, for uh, perpetuity. So first of all, the people who came by ship in Haiti do not identify with the term African-American. So as I was writing this piece, as I was writing a piece about my great grandfather, I went to the forest and I was awakened by the power of the Milky Way. And I stood up and I asked the, 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 the creator, I said, who do you say we are? Those and the descendants of those taken from Africa, shipped to all parts of the world as slaves. The spirit said, to me, you are like Jonah. Man, can learn this in music theory 101, that's for sure, <laughs> or history 101 either. To me, you're like Jonah. And the only difference between, uh, uh, and, and, and like Jonah, you hear it, you were, you, were hit, you were put into the womb of, of a ship. You were put into a wooden womb. The whale is an allegory, but he went down into the wood of the ship. And that's why he had to wrestle with what he had been given to do. So the creator says, the only difference between the Jonah's ship and your ship is that his ship was followed by seagulls and yours were followed by sharks. The slave trade changed the nine million year old migratory pattern of the sharks. They fed upon so many of us. So an African-American doesn't do it because many people, many Africans in America flew over on Learjets. So there had to be a name that is common to the, to the history of all of the people who suffered that terror and their descendants. And so in, in uh, Brazil, there are more of us that were taken in Brazil, to Brazil than to America. So we are in Peru, we're in Colombia, we are, we are in Boston. So what, in, what would be the term that connect us all? The Jonah people, the people of Jonah, man of Jonah, tribe of Jonah. So this is, this is the underlying purpose of this piece. So this is what the creator gave, said, to me, you're like Jonah. So that's, what, that's why this, people, this piece is called the Jonah people, uh, a legacy of struggle and triumph. Man, it's something. Oh. It is so, it's, I, want every, I want every human being in the world to, to, to see this piece. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> when when do you have a, a premiere date? Uh, well, I think it's spring 2022 20, because of COVID and everything. Yeah. And um, I'm really, I'm really moving on it very well. I'm moving on it at a pace that will, that will, unlike the commission with Larry, uh, make very slim the chances of having an ulcer. 
<laughs> in, in expecting the peace to be done quickly, you know, yeah. uh, or on, uh, in a timely manner. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's really, it's really some, it, it's really a powerful, powerful, powerful piece. It's so, man, I've always wanted to address the, the womb of the ship and what happened in the ship. Well, you do I always of, wanted to address that in we this do a manner. a little bit of that in African portraits. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And to actually have, for example, man, to actually have the example of after these Portuguese slave traders go down and they rape these men and women and children in the holes of the ship. They take three of the, the enslaved men up top. And one of the men is obviously mentally gone. Veil two, I write in veils, not movements, but there are four veils to this piece. One is, veil one is called Ile, which is Yoruba for home. Two is they swallow the ocean for me. Three is Nalele Kole, Nalela Kole, Yoruba for searching. And four, the new being. But at, at the end of, of veil two, they swallow the ocean for me. This one of the three slaves, they took a book up uh, 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 on top of the ship to douse him with water. He looks at the ocean and he looks back at his two uh, comrades as though he has figured something out. And so finally he looks at them and he says, you know, if we drink enough water, we can drain the ocean and walk back home. And he jumps over as if to do what he has figured out in his head. The two men standing there, they can't run for him. They'll be lashed or shot. So the only way they have to acknowledge him is to close their eyes. So after that, in the, in the, the last scene of this piece is this baby being held up by this woman who's in, in hell who is in human physical hell, feces, blood, everything you can imagine and can't imagine. And the last is that she holds up this baby. And I, 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 I have asked that the lighting engineer, when, when the light hits this baby, the light hits everyone in the hall. Because everyone in the, in the hall, everyone, everyone in the world, every human everywhere is responsible for every other human being everywhere. And until, until that lesson is understood, we're going to always be dropping bombs on each other mm -hmm. and always, always thinking we're better than each other. Mm -hmm. And we, and we miss this, we miss this indescribable gift called heaven on earth. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds amazing. We, I'm gonna to try to be there. Oh, yeah. you have to be, you know. Yeah. You have to be because, because your, 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 your gift is part of this. Yeah. Every, every, everyone that has, done anything for this entity known as Hannibal Lukumbe, it's theirs. I often say our opera, our work, our piece, because Lord knows alone, I, you know, I, I, I don't know, I'd be cutting grass in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> so you know, we're, we're at, the, at the end of the, the time here for the interview. 
Um, I just wanted to, you know, just ask you one more question uh, because we're at a school and we have many aspiring composers, young composers. So what is your advice for our composers at the school? Uh, send me an email. Uh, uh, I like writing letters and I always answer letters. And some of the questions they might have would certainly need more time than I would be able to address here, but I, I do want them to know, I do want them to have access to me. Um, but I guess in a kind of a nutshell, I, I, I would say to them to always seek the truth uh, of, of, what, of themselves and, uh, and of what they are addressing, what they are writing about. And, and as I stated, Often that for me personally, that deeper truth is always, always evident when I, when I, when I get out of the way, when I, when I remove my own ego from the process. <laughs>